Welcome to the House of Lords podcast. In this episode, we speak to Chloe Mawson, who is the Clerk Assistant for the House of Lords and the first woman to hold the role since it was created in the 1600s. Welcome to our July episode. We're beginning straight to our interview with Chloe Mawson, who is the second most senior person in the House of Lords administration shortly. It's also the start of the summer recess today, uh, the 23rd of July. It's been a busy end to the first part of this session with new reports from the Lords Economic Affairs Committee on the Bank of England's use of quantitative easing. Uh, We've also had the Communications and Digital Committee on freedom of expression online and also the European Affairs Committee on the rights of citizens. Yes, you can read more about all of those reports at parliament.uk forward slash lords. It's also been a busy time in the Lords Chamber. So we've had eight days of line by line checking of the Environment Bill at uh, the Bill's committee stage, plus checks of bills on leasehold reform and animal sentience. You might also have seen in the news that the government has agreed to accept a Lord's Amendment, and that amendment is on greater welfare rules for certain marine life, like octopuses, squid and lobsters. And if you watch any of the checking of these bills online, uh, you can watch meetings of the Lord's and its committees for free on the website. You'll see a member of staff sat at the big table in the centre of the Lord's chamber. It won't be either myself or Amy, but it could very well be Chloe Mawson. She's one Maybe of the one clerks. day, Matt. Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> She's one of the clerks that could be seen at the table during proceedings. Uh, She was recently appointed to the role of clerk assistant, which, as we said uh, in the intro, was created in the 1600s. Here she is explaining what the title really means and what it is really like to be a clerk in the Lords. I'm Chloe Mawson. I am clerk assistant in the House of Lords. Chloe, welcome to the podcast. First up, could you tell us what the clerk assistant does? Absolutely. Clerk assistant is a pretty uninformative job title Uh, but I'm actually used to having a pretty uninformative job title but because before I got this job I was clerk of the journals and clerk of the journals was a job that included many uh, really interesting and uh, important responsibilities and about two percent of those was going anywhere near the journals so yeah even that wasn't a great job description clerk assistant probably less so. I think the clerk assistant job title comes from the fact that the clerk assistant deputises for the clerk of the parliament and it's been known as the clerk assistant since 1640s. Nowadays the key aspects of the job that I've just taken over are ensuring the effective running of the chamber and grand committee and select committees through leadership and oversight of the parliamentary services functions which means that I manage the heads of office of the committee office, the legislation office, the journal office, Black Rod's office, the library and Hansard. Other things that I'm responsible for that I see as pretty key in this job include overseeing the development of procedural skills and knowledge in the House, both in terms of staff, but also in terms of training the deputies on the wall sack and and whips on their front bench duties and civil servants where they um, you know need to understand more about the house. I also sit regularly at the table um, and I oversee the production of the core procedural documents such as the Woolsack brief and the order paper minutes of proceedings and other things like that. And then I think the final thing I would really emphasise is that I am co-owner with the Commons Clerk Assistant of the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme and ensuring that that still relatively new scheme is a success for for everybody in the parliamentary community. One of the things you mentioned was sitting at the table in the chamber of the house. If people watch the House of Lords online or on TV, they'll often see a clerk working at the table. What's the clerk's role there? So whenever the house is sitting, a clerk must be at the table, which is the table at the centre of the house between the opposition and front bench government dispatch boxes. The clerk at the table is there to advise on procedure, to answer any questions members have on procedure to ensure the daily briefs that are given to the the Lord Speaker and and his deputies on the Woolsack are being followed and to ensure that it's very clear what decisions the House is taking. We're also responsible for recording those decisions of the House so that there is a 
clear record of, for example, what amendments have been agreed, what amendments have been disagreed, what amendments have been withdrawn. And that means that we can then make sure that the master copies of bills are correct and a legal records for decisions the House takes in the form of our minutes and journals. We also do other things that don't sound like a big responsibility, uh, like operating the clock and recording the attendances um, of members. Operating the clock is strangely, I find, the most stressful thing about being at the table because you you, you get to, to, to press the, the reset button when someone starts speaking because you're listening to the speech or you're recording the decision and, and actually n- nothing causes more cross spaces in the chamber than forgetting to reset the clock at the right time. <laughs> Then there are a few ceremonial aspects. So, um, well, not really ceremonial, but you take messages down to the Commons, wrapped in ribbon, march down to the Commons and present it. You receive messages from the Commons. You read out the first readings, bills and other things like that. In Hybrid House, there's been other duties because you're also the sort of link between the hub that is getting all the virtual participants ready and the house and you're sort of conveying messages between the two and making sure everything's lined up ready to go and everyone knows of any problems. You are one of the main people responsible for enabling the house to carry on functioning during the pandemic. You said there that there were slightly different arrangements in hybrid proceedings. What was that like having to so rapidly shift a long-standing institution to a whole new way of working? I, it was extraordinary. It was so different from anything I'd worked on before because it suddenly seemed to happen so quickly. You know, first of all, you were just hearing on the news that there was this virus that, you know, uh, was not even in this country. And then, OK, it looked like it might be coming. And then, oh, my gosh, it's here. We're all being, you know, told to stay in our houses and we've got to find a way for Parliament to operate at that point fully virtually or as close to fully virtually as we could get. There were of course huge challenges in terms of working out both how the house could work, uh, but actually what, what, legally what decisions could be taken in a virtual setting and what did actually require a formal uh, sitting of the house and also in terms of sort of developing the practical ways of doing that at extreme pace when Many staff were also juggling, whether it be homeschooling or supporting vulnerable friends and relatives. And, um, you know, people were going through some of the most stressful periods of their life, totally away from work, and then having to deliver the most extreme changes that we've seen in this place for a long, long time. I think overall, it was a really positive story because it showed that we could pull together and, and work collaboratively and make things happen. And lots of members and staff you know became much more digitally savvy and learned skills that will actually set us all in really good stead going forward and you know in terms of how we worked as an administration it really opened up opportunities for staff who not who had not previously had opportunities to get involved with you know uh, how the chamber works and supporting you know the core functions of the house they you know had many more opportunities to do that we worked much more sort of collaboratively across the board and that was really good and I hope it's something that we can sort of build on even um, as we come out of hybrid house. You know it's obviously been such a stressful period for everybody but a silver lining I suppose it has really enabled that sort of rapid change I don't think any of us could really have imagined before this I mean I don't think anyone would ever have thought we'd have been doing remote voting or anything like that in the House of Lords. If there hadn't been a pandemic and instead someone had said let's explore remote voting, maybe maybe we'll do some remote voting. It would have been a two to three year process, I mm. expect, to you know get the funding in place, get the project structures in place, work out whether it was bicameral or not bicameral, you know, get it prioritised against all our other uh, uh, priorities, make sure we have the right resources, consult members, you know, it, 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 in, and as it was, I think it was delivered in, you know, six or seven weeks from the idea to delivery. You mentioned before that some decisions had to physically be made in the chamber. How exactly does that work? Are there sort of specific rules for, you know, what dictates what has to take place in the building itself? There aren't. There, when we were facing all these decisions as we designed the the virtual house and then the hybrid house in March and April last year we had to 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 try and decide what constitutes the house you know the standing orders make it clear that the house can pass legislation the house can make decisions but but what is the house nowhere really defines that I mean clearly you've got to have a quorum of members but it doesn't have to be this chamber uh, the house has sat in other rooms you know at different points in history and you know if we were to be subject to to 
something happening terrible to the palace and we couldn't access the chamber. We have plans where Parliament can sit elsewhere. So we had to make a decision what it was that, that constituted the House. And what we really needed to do was be sure that wherever decisions were made about legislation, we wouldn't end up later in court challenged that legislation you know, uh, didn't have a sound basis because there was a challenge to our decision about what constituted the House. So we could access the chamber and the quorum is, is free for the House to make decisions. So we decided that while you could have all sorts of debates in a virtual uh, uh, setting, the actual formal decisions on legislation, on standing orders needed to be taken in the chamber with the quorum of three and what we did to ensure that we were sort of safe from challenge. And when the House comes back after the summer recess, it's expected that most members will attend in person again. Uh, but there will, of course, be some changes to the way that business operates. We sort of touched on it there, but do you think the pandemic has sort of enabled us to learn much about the best way to operate in a modern world? In some ways, yes. I think we found more efficient ways of doing things, particularly behind the scenes in supporting the chamber. And we've certainly found more inclusive ways of doing things that, you know, we already, the House has already decided to keep some of those. So, you know, the decision that physically disabled members will be able to continue to contribute virtually, that is a much more inclusive way of, of working. I think there are still many factors at play when uh, decisions are made about how the chamber should operate. and maybe there isn't a best way, there's just an evolving way that reflects the times and, you know, the, the skills that we have. But we've certainly all got much more digitally capable, both as administration and as members, and that is going to open up opportunities to continue to, to work uh, in a much more joined up way. You've not been in the role of clerk assistant very long yet, but when you found out that you were you were going to be appointed as clerk assistant, did you have any goals in mind? Anything you want to achieve during your time in the role? I hope that I can work with the management board to continue to work towards building a place of work where everyone feels valued and respected and supported and enabled to do a really good job. I hope that I can build uh, on the work that's been done to establish the independent complaints and grievance scheme to you know, continue to instill confidence that that is a fully independent and a, a effective scheme, but also that you know, there is more that we can do in the area of culture change that if we get it right over the next few years, actually might mean we don't need the ICGS or the ICGS is never used because we've actually changed the way that you know, we work across the board so that there is just a lot less need for an independent complaints and grievance scheme. I think that it's important to me as a woman that when I first started in the Lords there weren't a lot of senior women so to sort of build on the things that allowed me to get here in terms of flexible working opportunities uh, for all staff and, you know, schemes to help people who've been on career breaks to, to get back into the workplace in a supported way. Those kind of things are, are really important to me in terms of priorities for, for the next few years. So if I can take you back uh, to the beginning, as it were, and uh, talk about your career path to clerk assistant. You mentioned the clerk assistant sort of job description there and the fact the clerk assistant doesn't tell you an awful lot about what the job is so I can imagine though correct me if I'm wrong that wasn't a sort of long-standing ambition from childhood that you wanted to be clerk assistant when you were grown up what inspired you to join the Lords in the first place how, how did you get here by accident really <laughs> um I was in my final year at university and I wanted to become a clinical psychologist but I couldn't afford to go straight into postgraduate study so I really needed a job that would pay something that I could then save towards doing postgraduate study. So I applied for lots of graduate schemes uh, and one of them was the civil service graduate scheme. And at that time, there were multiple boxes. You know, I want to work for the Home Civil Service, the European Civil Service, the Foreign Office, Parliament. I think even the Secret Services were on there. And I think I ticked every single box because I really, really wanted a job. And then it was about a year long application process. And as I went through each stage, I started to focus on what I would want. Uh, out of all those choices if I was offered the job and I thought I'll go to the Department of Health for Health and work on mental health policy because I want to go and be a clinical psychologist that would be a really good uh, background 
And then it became clear that actually you don't have that kind of choice if you're going through the civil service graduate scheme. You can not really even choose the government department you end up in, let alone what policy area within that department you might end up in. And as I ticked all the boxes, I was invited to come to Parliament for a day um, as I got towards the end of the application process so that I could see what the place was like. And I just fell in love with the building and the sort of buzz and the atmosphere. So I decided sort of on a whim that this would be my first choice, a Commons or Lords, I didn't mind. And then I was off at Lords and, and I started and I thought, OK, this would be great. I'll do this for a year or two, save the money the postgraduate degree but I've always really enjoyed it and uh, the longer I stayed the more interesting the work became you know the more friends I made the more I valued my colleagues and now we're 21 years later I haven't started that postgraduate degree but you never know one day. You mentioned some of the things that sort of helped you get to where you are now you know flexible working was one example you gave how, how difficult has it been to get to sort of clerk assistant? You mentioned joining the House 21 years ago. What what was it like for women in Parliament back then? So I joined in autumn 1999. And at that point, it was actually really different to now, even though 1999 is not the dark ages. Um, and in many areas of life, I don't think it you know, would have been that different to be a woman in an organisation versus a man in an organisation. When I think back now, I'm not even sure how aware I was at the time, but I remember I was stopped a lot more in the corridors you know can you show your pass a lot more than my male colleagues were I remember a senior colleague at his retirement party he had hired a few female clerks and at that point although there had been female clerks there hadn't been many and he definitely hired more than others and in his retirement speech he turned to us we happened to be standing together and he said oh it's been an experiment but I've I've hired so many women um, it's still an experiment and the, the, the results are, are not in yet. But one thing we do know that they brought to the organisation is pulchritude. And I didn't know what pulchritude meant. And I was sort of standing in this party thinking, oh, maybe that means like incredible intellectual acumen or creative thinking. And his speech ended and I turned to a colleague and I said, what's pulchritude? And they said, beauty. The, 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 you know, the experiment's out, but he does at least know that you're a bit more attractive than the other people he could have hired. And I don't think that would happen now at all nobody would think it was okay to say that but those kind of things happened I remember when I had my second child a, another long departed colleague um, said to me when I announced that I was pregnant oh you know with one child you can have a career and be a mother but with two you'll probably find that you need to stay at home now and again you'd never get that now and this is not that long ago my second child is 12 so you know there were certainly things like that that I encountered on the other hand you know I had so many great opportunities here and so many fantastic managers who did encourage me and you know I benefited from you know being able to work part-time compressed hours job share you name it I've tried it and quite often they were things that hadn't been tried before and I did have to sort of negotiate them and push them a little bit but I was given them and and they allowed me to build my career and balance that with family and Overall, it's been an incredibly positive experience for me. Not only has it been a positive experience for me, but it's just really good to see that it's now, you know, uh, much easier across the organisation to get all those kind of uh, flexible working deals. And again, the pandemic, I hope, has meant that those will become even easier for everyone to access, not just women, not just mothers, but everybody, so that they can, you know, find ways to progress their careers while balancing all sorts of other important parts of their lives. And of course, your counterpart in the Commons is also, that role is also held by a woman. So has the glass ceiling finally been broken in Parliament or is there more to do? Huge strides have been made. I mean, as you say, both me and the Clark Assistant in the Commons are women. Uh, Black Rod is a woman. <laughs> um, not too many years ago, there were no women at all on the Lords Management Board. Then we had our first woman, but it was through getting a non-executive. It wasn't, you know, someone who worked here who'd managed to work their way up to management board level. But now we've got five women on the Lord's management board. We're nearly at parity. So huge, huge strides have been made. I think that, you know, there are still more to do. We still have a significant gender pay gap that, that needs to be addressed. And I worry that in general, not just in the Lords, but across the working world, COVID has put a sharper focus on gender inequality. And women are more likely to have to, or have been more likely throughout the pandemic to have to sort of adjust their working hours because of, you know, lack of childcare support and lack of consistent schooling. And so the flexible working that we have 
been able to all explore during the pandemic, I think will be key for women going forward because it allows people to balance paid and unpaid work in a way that works for them. And so I really hope that we can use our experience the last 18 months to continue to allow as much flexibility as we can, while, of course, ensuring that we give really good services to the house and just make sure we don't go back to a time where flexible working feels like a risk to your career progression, because certainly at times I worried about that. And I hope that we're now in a new age where that's just not the case anymore. And cracked, if not totally smashed for women in Parliament. There are still other glass ceilings and there's a lot of work we need to do to make the same progress, for example, for colleagues from BAME backgrounds as we have made for our female colleagues over the last few years. And definitely one of the things that I'm really excited about now that I have a voice on the management board is that, you know, I have a voice that I can use to to push for that kind of progress. Chloe, your husband is a clerk in the Commons. Is there much inter-house rivalry? If there isn't, this is a time to stoke some, I think. So go ahead. (laughs) I don't think there is a huge amount of inter-house rivalry. I mean, there's a bit of sort of, you know, gentle rubbing when one of us feels that, that, you know, our house has done something particularly noteworthy. You can't see it because this is an audio podcast, but on my office wall, I have a picture of all three of my children as, as babies each of them wearing the same baby grey, which has a portcullis across the front. And they're all printed in black and white. And we printed them in black and white because then you can't tell whether it's a red or green portcullis. So you don't know which which baby supports which house. But I have to say, because I knew you were going to ask this question, I did ask my children over breakfast this morning if they could work for the Commons or the Lords, which they would work for. And the two youngest said the Lords, mainly because there's more gold, and the oldest said the Commons. So that was where they'd ended up having watched us for their whole lives. And probably understanding financial privilege as well. Um, I'm sure she was massively driven by the desire. I've I've got a very twisted sense of what young people know and feel about Parliament, haven't I? Um, I think even my nearly 15-year-old child with, you know, one Commons Clark parent and one's Lords Clark parent and multiple visits to Parliament and all these things could not tell you about financial privilege. (laughs) So I'm sorry to disappoint you. Don't worry, I'll be uh, teaching one of the Purvis clan all about it when they're uh, listening to me, finally. Final question, What what what's your most memorable or favourite moment um, from your time working at the house so far? So many. I mean, I've worked here for 21 years. As I've said, I've made so many friends and I've learned so much from colleagues and from members. I met my husband here, I christened my kids in the chapel, um, I used the nursery for childcare. Um, I've got so many memories um, uh, uh, that that I sort of cherish from the last 21 years. I think work-wise, you know, there's always a buzz when you are closely involved with advising at pace when things are developing that are in the national news agenda and you feel a real sort of buzz, or I certainly get a real buzz from that. And there's been a lot of that over the last few years, you know, around passage of Brexit legislation or the 2019 prorogation you know you see all the cameras rolling and the protesters shouting and you're running around and you just you know there's a lot of adrenaline and it's 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 great I've worked on some really big events in Westminster Hall that I you know have always found really exciting like you know in terms of the addresses whether that be from the Queen or the Pope or Obama or others um, I've really enjoyed working on all those and and seeing all those people I think on committees you know, you learn so much when you're a committee part running inquiries in depth in areas you've never thought about before. And suddenly you become, you know, an incredible expert in that area for a few months. And of course, sometimes committee visits make really good memories. I think my favourite committee visit memory was a visit with the communications committee at that point chaired by Lord Fowler before he became Lord Speaker. And we were looking into the ownership of the news and the influence that owners of of news organisations have over their editors. And we met Rupert Murdoch long before the Commons Committee met him in the big high profile evidence session in Port Carlos House. Uh, We met him in New York and we also went to the Washington Post and were uh, sitting down with the editor of the Washington Post to talk about the future of investment journalism and lots of uh, important things like that. When he told us that Brad Pitt was in the newsroom and was about to have a tour of the newsroom. And would we like to join Brad Pitt on the tour? And the chair said, no, we've got to get on with this conversation. So I never got to do the Brad Pitt newsroom tour, which is a huge sadness. So that would have been my favourite memory, but I didn't get to live it. I'm not sure we can top that, really. One final thing, actually, I was, I was going to add as you were talking there, 
about knowledge and sitting on committees and learning so much. Of course, a former clerk of the Parliament's one mastermind um, some years back. Do all clerks make brilliant quizzes? If they do, then I'm not a proper clerk because I'm terrible at quizzes. And in fact, my absolute nightmare would be going on to a quiz, you know, in public, especially on television, uh, like last mind, and in the general knowledge round being asked something about Parliament and then not being able to answer it and being discovered as some massive fraud. So I, you will never see me on Mastermind or in fact at any quiz whatsoever because I'm not very good at them. On the other hand, my husband is. So maybe, maybe, maybe Commons colleagues are good at quizzes. I don't know. Well, Chloe, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I, I really enjoy listening to the podcast. So it's an honour to actually be invited to come and talk to you all. And that's it for the summer episode of the podcast. Uh, we'll be back in the autumn with a new series. In the meantime, you can get in touch with us by leaving a comment wherever you get your podcasts or by tweeting us at UK House of Lords. In those comments, please tell us what you'd like us to cover in the new series, subjects you'd like to hear more about, topics you'd like explained, or which members perhaps you'd like us to interview.